Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Uh, greetings everyone far and wide. Uh, we especially welcome Andy and Catherine and Millie. Uh, it's lovely to see new faces. Praise Yah. And for everyone online, um, welcome. And we hope you enjoy uh, today's Parsha, which is Mishpatim. Parsha Mishpatim. But as always, before we start, uh, let's just remind ourselves of the creed that we follow and um, that we try to we strive to adhere to at Almond House. It's um, it's scriptural. It's based on love. It's love God and love your neighbour as yourself. Which sounds easy to do, but when you've got neighbours like Joe or um, <laughs> or if you're married, etc., it can be hard sometimes. <laughs> but um, as Michelle will testify to. But um, this is um, our Lord sets the, the bar high. Because if it was any lower, we'd probably fail at that too, and we'd be even more of a wretch than some of us already are, including myself. But um, we base it on loving God and loving your neighbour as yourself. And for anybody who wants to seek what love truly is biblically, I recommend the first, uh, first John, the book of First John. It it's, it's, uh, explains it wonderfully. And uh, we also um, refer to First Corinthians 13, which is, uh, which is Paul. Would you like to recite that for us, please, Joe? Yeah, sure. Uh, Paul Thank tells you. us what love is, and he tells us that love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, love does not boast, love is not proud and is not puffed up, love does not behave indecently, love reckons not to do any evil, and it does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but love rejoices in the truth. Love covers all, believes all, expects all, and endures all. This love never fails. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Joe. Written on the heart. On the heart. That's beautiful. Um, yeah. And we also refer to uh, Mark 12, when Yeshua, Jesus, was asked there, uh, which is the greatest command. And uh, yet again, our Lord quotes from the Torah. And um, it's the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Shema Israel. Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. We have to add Adonai Elohecha, Bekol Avevcha, Ubekol Nefshecha, Ubekol Meodecha. And then he says, the first, this is the first commandment, and the second, like it, is this, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. I have to Larecha Kamocha. There is no other commandment greater than these. And all the prophets and all the law hang on this. In other words, everything in the Bible hangs on loving God and loving your neighbour as yourself. It's all about the selfless love. And Yeshua says, um, if you love me, you'll do my commands. You will shema my commands, uh, which is to hear and do and to obey in faith. So that's our creator, Roman House. Um, love God and love your neighbour. It's all this selfless love. Okay, so we're on Mishpatim, Torah, Mishpatim today. Um, it may come across a little bit tedious because it's, it seems at first glance like a long list of rules and regulations, but um, if we're just hanging on there, we're going to reveal hopefully some, some real beauty in the scriptures here today. It's not just a long list of rules and regulations. As always, we look at the the Hebrew meaning of the word, of the title of the Parsha. As we know, it's Mishpatim. And Mishpatim is the plural for the singular word Mishpat, which itself means a right ruling, um, a judgment, ordinance, regulation, those kind of similar meanings. And Mishpat itself comes from the root word Shafat, which is where we get the word for a judge, you know, um, and it means to judge or to govern to rule, to give a law. Um, it's the second word of today's Parsha in the Hebrew. Um, and as I said, it just means a type of decree, uh, like a legal pronouncement, an authoritative decree. But these, Ms. Patim, they're not man's rules and regulations, they're higher than man. These are from the Most High. It's practically so, it's, um, it's divine law. These are divine rules and regulations. And there's only one who gives us the law by which we must be governed and must live by. 
and that's Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. We are to hear and to do, to faithfully obey him, to shamar his judgments, his rulings and his regulations. So we'll come back to that word further down the line, but let's recap um, where we're up to and outline where we're going today. Last week in Parsha Yitzho, which Joe covered, uh, we saw how Yitzho converted from pagan ways, didn't he? And he came to rejoice with the Israelites for everything that the true God, the one true God, had done for them. And we also read that Yitzho gave Moses um, wise counsel uh, concerning the appointments of leaders and judges, remember? And of course, we read of the Ten Commandments being delivered to the whole nation, which was an, an amazing uh, event in itself. This week in Parsha Mishpatim, we're going to be reading of God's statutes. They're mainly concerning morals and ethics in the, on the whole. Uh, it, it, it talks about how we are to be toward our God and toward our neighbour, and even toward animals and, and nature. We'll, we'll see that in the chapters coming up. Basically, God has given us uh, the most supreme guidelines, the highest guidelines possible, really, uh, for living. And at the same time, he's revealing his righteousness and his perfection. This is what we see. Now, here, we're still at the foot of the mountain in this parasha. Um, we're at the feet of God and we're here to receive and to learn from him. And when we get to chapter 24, verse 10, we'll see that we literally are at the feet of God. Um, and we're here to learn how to live before him and to live with each other. And who better to show us than our God? You know, in, in, through our lives and through history, we can see people like Einstein, Aristotle, Confucius. And these are all highly regarded people, highly regarded men. And in some ways, they can be educational and instructive. But what about the one who made the sun and the stars and the moon? Wouldn't you rather listen to him? Well, I would. So we learn from him. We learn. He's the master. He's the creator. He's the most high. He's the ultimate authority, is our God. So, Mr. Team, as I said earlier, at first sight, it might look like a long list of rules and regulations. You're thinking, oh, and now I have to admit that when I first read the Bible um, quite a few years ago, I read it back to back twice. And I've been coming across this and I'm thinking, oh, God, it's a bit like genealogies. You know, you're sort of thinking, well, I'll read through it, but you're not taking anything in, really. You're thinking, well, I've read it, I've read it. I've done the chapter, and you're not really taking anything in. It's just a another long list, it seems. But really, um, it's a revealing of one's heart, because my heart wasn't really there. But if you really want to get something from this and you're seeking truth, God will open your eyes and you, you will see things. And it's uh, really, Miss Petim is, um, these are perfect guidelines for how we're supposed to live. So it's well worth seeking and looking into the for our benefit basically and as i said they revealed that the perfect nature of our god um, his rules and regulations are way beyond those of man we live by man's rules we can't avoid that we have to um, until it contravenes with god's law of course um, but in this world it's a uh, hasatan uh, he rules this world of course we know he's on a leash from, them, from our God, he's, he's just on a leash, but he rules this world. And Hasatan masquerades as an angel of light. Mm. Um, he's in disguise. He's hiding who he really is. Basically, Hasatan wears a mask. Now for two years, the last two years, man's rules are saying that we must wear a mask. Um, now it's just my opinion. But for me, it's just a means of social control. It's a deliberate instilling of fear into people in order to compel them to conform. If you remember, not long before it, people were saying, don't wear anything on your face. You've got to see who you are for security. Mm -hmm. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. And people were getting discriminated against for their religion because they were covered up. Said, no, no, you can't be doing that. Take it off. We need to see who you are. Next minute, all of a sudden, oh, you must put a mask on. You think, but... This is there, but it's messing with people's minds. In other words, you just do as we say, right? But they'll come with a, they'll, they'll save it up with sugar. They say, oh, because of this, it's for your own benefit. Well, okay, well, 
I think it's social control on myself. But we have now here, it's, we're told one thing basically, but the truth is being hidden. And this word for mask and the word for masquerade, they derive from the same root. They're of the same derivation. This masquerade is also a dance. And so we have here, we have deception, we have lies, and we have dancing. And uh, we were speaking on this in the week, uh, Joseph and myself, and uh, it all points to the musical liar. Mm. Hasatan is the musical liar. And I'll refer anyone online here and in the room to go back a couple of uh, Torah cycles to Pasha Pinkas, where Joe did a very good um, a thorough investigation of this, where Hasatan is revealed as a musical liar. So I'll refer people to, to have a look at that, it's wonderful. But back to this masks and masquerades, etc. People in 16th century Italy, they would wear masks. It was like it, it became a phase, a fad. And they do they, they to engage in all kinds of debauchery uh, while their true identity was hidden. See, well, no one knows who I am. I can do this, I can do that. Does it doesn't matter, no one knows. But this, uh, the, this masked ball, you'd have a ball, basically, and you would have a ball. The masked ball or the masquerade ball, it's, it's since spread through all of Europe from Italy. It's gone across the Americas, the Caribbean, most parts of the world, actually. And it still goes on now, this. And in many instances, it's been integrated into Halloween, which speaks for itself. You know, it's, these things aren't done for godly purposes. They're quite the opposite. And we see it now with the, in the last two years. It has a tan, wears a mask. He's pretending to be good of the light, but really he's engaging in some sinister agenda through deception. And it can be the same on the whole with the rules and regulations of man. You know, they're supposed to be for our good, but in reality, they're not. Most of the time, just my opinion. In reality, there's a hidden agenda, a masked agenda taking place. Uh, and these are all part of the rules and regulations of man. And here now, we have the rules and regulations of God. Hallelujah. Okay? Hallelujah. That's where we are with Miss Patine. We have the rules and regulations of Almighty God, and they are a portrayal of God's perfect character. Uh, no hidden agenda, just the truth. Okay? That's why we read Miss Patine. It looks like a long list of rules, but it's, it's real beauty. Right, we just looked at the word uh, mispat in the Hebrew, and I said we'll come back to the word. Let's have a look at it in the Greek now. This word mispat, the singular for mispatim. In the Greek, it's uh, entole, 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 something like that. It means a command, it's uh, an ordinance, an injunction. A command, a law, and it comes from the root word entolamai, which also means an injunction. It's practically an authoritative prescription. Now, authoritative, well, who's the, the ultimate authority? It's God. He's righteous. He is perfect justice. So what we have here in this parasha is a prescription from the master physician. This is how Mr. Team should be looked at. These are prescriptions from our God. We've all heard the saying, oh, that was just what the doctor ordered, you know, because, you know, it's something good for you and it does, it does you good, you know. Well, our God is the master physician. There's no doctor better than our God. No one knows better than him what is good for us. His children, he knows best. Everything he says and does is for our benefits, is for our own good. He gives us the guidelines along the road of life. And this partial is part of this. Most of us have cars. I've got a car and I've got a manual there, a car manual. I haven't really looked at it to be honest until something goes wrong, but it's there. But even if you get a flat pack chest of drawers from Ikea, it will come with a set of instructions, you know. For us now, our Bible is our manual for life, okay. The Bible is our manual for life. And Parsha Mispatim is part of that. It's all the guidance we'll ever need. In contrast to some of man's laws that we've just discussed, these hidden agendas. These mispatim that we're going to read out just now, they're not here to deceive us or to subjugate us or to trick us. They're here to guide us. These judgments reveal the nature and the heart of our God. He's perfect, he's just, he's righteous. 
There's no hidden agenda, it's the truth. It's funny how you mentioned that. Um, <clears throat> you get a, a manual with your car, and like you don't read it until you get a flat tire. Yeah. yeah. And then that's when you'll read it. Yeah. And like, I don't know about you, but when I get the flat pack, I just have a go myself. I think I'm not looking at that brochure. It comes in Italian, Spanish. Yeah. I can never even find the language. Yeah. So I'll we'll just have a go myself. When it starts going wrong, I'm like, where's that manual? <laughs> and, and that's like for life, isn't it? Because it's when things start going wrong, people go to the Bible and yeah. I always say Bible stands for basic instruction before leaving earth. Beautiful. The Bible, it is the manual the for life. The manual. Well, lovely. It is the manual That's for wonderful life. Lecture. But you want to be in it before something starts going wrong. Yes, yeah. it's true. Because I'm being guilty in the past myself of using God like a first aid kit. Yeah. You know, he, oh, I'm all right, I'm getting on. And bang, something happens. You go, please God, blah, blah, blah. And <laughs> that's not what we've learned. That's not what it's about. Exactly, yes. It's a daily relationship we're supposed to have with our Lord, you know. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, so these prescriptions we're going to read of now, Miss Patine, are merciful and just and righteous, just like our Lord Jesus. These prescriptions in Miss Patine promote love and restitution. They promote life, just like our Lord Jesus, Yeshua. Isaiah 33, for the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. Hallelujah. John 12, I didn't come to judge the world, but to save the world, not to trick them. Throughout scripture, God's justice, his righteousness, his mercy, and his truth, they're all linked. They're practically the same thing. Psalm 89, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mm. Mercy and truth go before your face. Mm. Isaiah 33 again, he has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. Our God is just, he's righteous, he's full of mercy and truth, and he wants us to be like him. He wants us to be like him. Way back in Genesis 18, he says, For I have known him, he's speaking about Abraham, For I have known him, in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. So as I've said, we're dealing with God's governance, which is way above man's. Everything God says and does is perfect. These are right rulings. It's another title for Miss Petine, right rulings. Right as in correct and right as in righteous. Miss Petine, John 5, my judgment is righteous. And these, what we're going to read of today, are forever. These rules and regulations that God lays down are forever. That includes for us. That includes now. They're not in the past and something that someone has come along and abolished. Quite the opposite. Psalm 119, 142. Your righteous is an everlasting righteousness. Your Lord is truth. 119, 160. The entirety of your word is truth and every one of your righteous judgments, Miss Petim, endures forever. Not like, oh, it's the past and we don't do that now. Every one of your righteous judgments, your Miss Petim, endures forever so here we are but at his feet at the foot of the mountain receiving from him learning his ways and he came and he walked with us to show us the way so let's glance back at it we read him um, we're going to read it now so we're on verse uh, chapter 21 and we're going to read right through to 22 verse 12. So we're going to read all of chapter 21 and carry on to 22 verse 12, okay? So. Now these are the judgments which we, you shall set before them. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall save six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free and pay nothing. If he comes in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife and she's born him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters and he shall go out by himself. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost and his master shall pierce his ear with an all and he shall save him forever. And if a man sells his daughter to be a, a female slave 
or female servants. She shall not go out with the male servants do. Please her master, who has been sold her to himself, that he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people, since he has dealt deceitfully with her. And if he has been sold her to his son, he shall deal with her according to the custom of daughters. If he takes another wife, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, and her marriage rights. And if he does not do these three for her, then she shall go out free without paying money. He who strikes a man, sorry, dies, shall surely be put to death. However, if he didn't lie in wait, but God delivered him into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place where he may flee. But if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbour to kill him by treachery, you shall take him from my altar, that he may die. And he who strikes his father or mother shall surely be put to death. He who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. And he who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. If men contend with each other and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist, and he doesn't die but is confined to his bed, if he rises again and walks about outside with his staff, then he who struck him shall be acquitted. He shall only pay for the loss of his time and shall provide for him to be thoroughly healed. And if a man bits his male or female servant with a rod, so that he dies under his hand, he shall surely be punished. Notwithstanding, if he remains alive a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is his property. If men fight and hurt a woman with child, so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished accordingly as the woman's husband imposes on him. And he shall pay as the judges determine. But if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, bane for bane, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. If a man strikes the eye of his male or female servants and destroys it, he shall let him go free for the sake of his eye. And if he knocks out the tooth of his male or female servants, he shall let him go free for the sake of his tooth. If an ox goes a man or a woman to death, then the ox shall surely be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be acquitted. But if the ox tended to thrust with its horn in times past, and it has been, known to his, been made known to his owner, and he's not kept it confined, so that it's killed a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and its owner shall also be put to death. If there is imposed on him a sum of money, then he shall pay to redeem his life, whatever is imposed on him. Whether it is God a son or God a daughter, according to this judgment, it shall be done to him. If the ox goes a male or female servant, he shall give to their master thirty shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. And if a man opens a pit, or if a man digs a pit and doesn't cover it, and an ox or a donkey falls in it, the owner of the pit shall make it good. He shall give money to their owner, but the dead animal shall be his. If one man's ox hurts another's, so that it dies, then they shall sell the live ox and divide their money from it. And the dead ox they shall also divide. Or if it was known that the ox tended to thrust in time past, and its owner has not kept it confined, he shall surely pay ox for ox, and the dead animal shall be his own. If a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four for a sheep. If the thief is found breaking in and he is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. If the sun has risen on him, there shall be guilt for his bloodshed. He should make full restitution. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. If the theft is certainly found alive in his hand, whether it is an ox or a donkey or a sheep, he shall restore double. If a man causes a field or a vineyard to be grazed and lets loose his animal and it feeds in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best of his own field and the best of his own vineyard. If fire breaks out and catches in thorns so that stacked grain, standing grain or the field is consumed, he who kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. If a man delivers to his neighbour money or articles to keep and it's stolen out of the man's house, if the thief is found, he shall pay double. If the thief is not found, then the master of the house shall be brought to the judges to see whether he's put his hand into his neighbour's goods. For any kind of trespass, whether it concerns an ox, a donkey, a sheep, or clothing, or for any kind of lost thing, which another claims to be his, the cause of both parties shall become shall come before the judges, 
and who, whomever the judges condemn shall pay double to his neighbor. If a man delivers to his neighbor a donkey, an ox, a sheep, or any animal to keep, and it dies, is hurt, or driven away, no one seeing it, then an oath of the Lord shall be between them both, that he has not put his hand into his neighbor's goods, and the owner of it shall accept that, and he shall not make it good. But if in fact it is stolen from him, he shall make restitution to the owner of it. Okay, so the previous chapter there, 21. Um, if we look, go back to verse 2. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall save six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free and pay nothing. Now, I want us to remember this verse because we're going to come back to it toward the end. So, just remember, if you buy Hebrew servants, you shall save six years, and the seventh you shall go free, out free and pay nothing. Just remember that. Keep that in mind because we will return to that towards the end. And then we've got here verses 5 and 6, which are related to verse 2, actually. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Which should be our attitude to our God, by the way. We just want to save him. We don't want anything else out in the world. We want to save our God. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door, the doorpost, etc. So here, the servant has a free will whether to save the master or not. And for me, that reflects how God grants us free will to save him or not. He's not a despot. He's not a tyrant. He gives us the free will, you know. I think that's, for me, that's what it's pointing to there. We have free will. The servant has free will to save the master or not. We have free will to save our God or not. Um, verses 23 to 25. But if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, all the way down to stripe for stripe. Now, we all know this verse. It's quite tame. It's been doc well documented, obviously. And... Um, and I think in previous parts, it's been, it passes in Torah cycles, it's been well covered. These mispetim that we read about, God's put in place for our benefit. All these mishaps, the fightings, the injuries, the thefts, the deaths, the losses, etc. These will have always occurred. It's nothing new. These, will, these had always occurred. But they were not always addressed correctly. You know, people would have be maimed and killed and kidnapped and tortured and put to sleep, whatever. They were never always addressed correctly. And God has had to address these for our sakes. That's what's going on in this team. All these things will have happened and God has showed us how you deal with such situations. And he's definitely not advocating revenge. He's not saying if you lose a tooth, you go over and smack him in the face and take his tooth out. It may look like that at first sight, but it's definitely not that. He's not advocating revenge. After all, revenge is the Lord's, by the way, not ours. Our God is teaching and promoting restitution. This is what he's doing. It's about restitution. It's restoration. God's promoting restorative justice. This is what he's doing here. Remember, our God is love. He's not hate. He's love. God is love. He's promoting restitution to restore their things to their proper order. Revelation 21, he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things anew. Our Lord restores all things to their proper order, and he's showing us how to do it. Um, we'll touch on that a bit more later on. Yeah, so, and then we, we covered the first 12 verses of um, chapter 22, didn't we? Verses 3, 5, 6, and 12. You, you can glance at them in one little... In one little go, with your eyes. Verses 3, 5, 6 and 12. Restitution, 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 restitution. God is teaching us how to live with our neighbour and how to love our neighbour. And like him, we are to restore. Behold, I make all things anew, he says. It's beautiful, really. These are... Um, these laws, these rules and regulations are not to condemn us or to trick us. These are here for our benefit. They're beautiful. He, um, 
if the whole world just listened to our, our Lord, Yeshua, if the world listened to Jesus, he doesn't want war and strife. He wants us to live together lovingly. And if we listen to him, we'd have heaven on earth right now. We really would. Um, he just wants us to live together lovingly. This is why our creed's based on love. Matthew 5, Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called the sons of God. If the world love God and love each other, one another, as their neighbour, as Jesus teaches, we would have heaven and earth right now. Um, Yeshua says, you have heard it said. Yeah. Because at the time, the rabbis, they were, they were, they were applying with the oral law. Uh, if someone if someone does this to you, then you seek revenge in that way. It was an oral application. This is why he didn't say it is written, because he goes from you have heard it said to it is written. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but Yeshua actually says, with what measure you use, it will be used against you. Mm -hmm. And this is what an eye for an eye actually meant. Yeah. It was um, mm -hmm. it was a Hebrew idiom for restorative justice. Yeah. In fact, we still have that going on today. If you're in work and you get hit by a forklift or you fall on a building site and you break your legs, you can go to a claims court and you have insurance where they will give you a measure for compensation for what injury you have. Your time inflicted. of work, etc. It still takes place today. Uh -huh. with, 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 the, with the police and the justice system, uh, with fines and compensation. So it still takes place today. And what this was actually saying is, you know, if, if, if you take someone's eye out, you know, the measure of that will be you provide work for them, you work on their vineyard, you, you, you help and assist them for, for, for the loss that they've made. So it was always about balanced scales, yeah. because as the Lord says, this is one of the things he loves, honest measures mm -hmm. and balanced scales. But people were taking that as God's law and turning it into a weapon yeah. in order to take vengeance. But the Lord says, vengeance is mine, yes. says the Lord. Thank you, Joseph. Yeah, truly. Yeah. You got something to add to that? Yeah, I think it's interesting when you look at um, a lot of kind of social justice, uh, it's based on like equality. It's all about being equal. But I think God deals in equity, which is where, you know, like you say, he can compensate with like a, a fair means, a fair assessment. Because God is judge, he deals in equity and he can see the heart of the matter and he can execute that, that righteous judgment. But in the world, it's all about everything being equal, which I, I think is dishonest to, to how God's created everything. So, uh -huh. I think that's something yeah, that thanks. No, that's, yeah, that's why I tried to make the point that we have man's laws and, you know, they're not all wrong, man's laws, by the way, despite what you might think my opinion is. But, but God's laws are far superior. So when we read God's rules and regulations, you cannot get any higher authority. Like, like the Darren said, um, he sees to the heart of the matter. He will be just. He will cut to the bone to be just, you know. He's perfect and righteous. So at first sight, you think this is just another list of, I haven't got an ox, you know. I, I haven't got a field that need, you know. These are for our benefit even now. Hallelujah. If if Jesus was walking along with us now today in this room, he'd say, this is how you deal with this. If this happens, this is how you deal with it. And that's what God is teaching us. And you get a lot of people then, especially like in the Sunday church, they may go, well, well, what are you going to, are you going to stone someone then? Because it says in these laws that th th this carries the death penalty. But actually like, even in states in America, if you've got a pit bull, an American pit bull, and that dog mauls a child, mm -hmm. you get life, you can even get the death penalty for that. It happens today in this country. Mm -hmm. If you've got if you've got a dog, maybe like, a, a, I don't know, a, a dog that's vicious and it, it takes out a child and it, as it says, it gnaws, it kills a child, you can go to prison for life. Mm -hmm. So when we read about these things that, that carry the death penalty, uh, we don't apply that, of course, but these things will be applied by the perfect judge, the one who will cast the stone, the one who is without sin, and when he comes, these can carry the, the, the second death for them that do not repent. So when we read it, we go flip and act like that's a bit deep, that's a bit heavy. Mm. Well, if you've got if you've got a dog and, you, and, you, and you've trained it up in that way and it, it's, a, it's a fighting dog and that kills a child, you know, you are responsible for that. Mm. And, and, and the Lord will, will judge you for that. He is our lawgiver, so he is he our judge. actually carry the death penalty because mm -hmm. you're going to be responsible when you go before him with the great white throne. Exactly. And it, there is there is life on the line spiritually yes. uh -huh. so when we read about things that carry the death penalty we've got to always see it with the lens of he's the judge he's the king 
and he's going to be the one who who gives life or takes it away and if we've done things in this life that are worthy of the death penalty praise btr for the blood of the lamb and the privilege of repentance that we can get back to him and be forgiven for those things but we can still see the severity of it when we read mishpatim yeah because it's got the weight of how the lord deals with these things that yeah it is wrong yeah. so yeah he's, still yeah, he's, he's, he's promoting love and eradicating evil basically from within us you know but it's, it's a total difference this is god's way of doing things and, and against man's basically when you look at the option that they give the evad in the hebrew it means uh, servant yeah. Yeah. Uh, would he give the evad the opportunity to stay because if you love your master and say i do not want to depart well if you're a slave and you're literally like a slave you're gonna go you, you're not you're not even gonna want that option on the table why would you love your master you've been exactly you know you've been treated in a terrible way because you're a slave and it's against yeah. your free will uh-huh you were a bond servant you were bound yeah in order to work off debt. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but in doing that, it was integrated in society because we then, like, if you're taking someone in, we, we, we get blessed because we, we have someone who's a bond servant to our household and you bless them because, as you said, you put them a roof over the head, you give yeah. them food, and then when they were going to go, you had to bless them anyway. Yeah, yeah. You had to give yeah. them means so they could get on the feet, yeah. start an enterprise and a house of their own. I mean, yeah. what, what is this? It's godly, isn't it? What beautiful. is this? Imagine like we it's go beautiful. and take a loan out in a bank, yeah? You know, the, the interest rates are just like yeah. extortionate. You miss a payment, you've got people coming around, breaking into your house, yeah. taking your stuff take, away. Take, take. If you don't pay it, you got red letters, yellow letters, yeah. then next minute you're in prison. <clears throat> for, for the Hebrews, you, you, would, you would lend, you would borrow, but then you would you would be taken into a household so that you could learn the ways of the master and you could also inherit good things from it. Like imagine a debt company like actually giving you money again to get on your feet yeah. and saying we don't even want that back. Yeah. Get get your own business. Here's a business plan. It is a business loan. You'd be like wow. So that's 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 fundamentally what it was like. Yeah. You know you'd never see these these loan companies or that. Uh, giving people money to like get on the feet so they could pay them back. Yeah. But if you think of prisons nowadays, um, it's a punitive. Uh, it's a like punitive revenge. You've done wrong. You're going in the cell. We're going to punish you. And then when you get out, you probably do the same thing again because you haven't really learned anything. But then you got restorative justice. It, it sort of started coming. It's, I think it was abroad and it came into the UK in you know, like probably the last ten years or more. Where, for example, if I, I, I crash my car into someone's garden wall and smash everything up, it sets it, it's a silly example, but rather than getting locked up for it and doing like six months and getting back out and thinking, what the heck was all that about? You now will be on conditional, what do you call it? Conditional, um, yeah, but where you, you work off your, your debts basically to society. What's, what's, community it's, service. Community service, thank you. You get community service. Yeah. We're like, from nine to five each day, you had to go around and rebuild that woman's garden wall. And in so doing, she'd be bringing out cups of tea and all that, and then you'd form a relationship, you know? It's restorative justice. And people say, oh, that's a good idea. Well, it was, it was in the Bible thousands of years ago. Our God shown us this. And when you contrast it with the nations around him, that would, um, we'll see in a chapter to come, where like, you'd, you'd, you'd get a baby sheep and boil it in its own mother's milk. You know, the nations were doing all this nonsense, and he's saying, you don't do that, by the way. I want a people with morals and ethics, mm-hmm. etc. Not long witnessed Sodom and Gomorrah, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm-hmm. If you went into Sodom or Gomorrah or any of those towns as an outsider, they're going to mug you, they'll take your clothes off you, they'll beat you up and leave you for dead. You know? And they're saying, no, you, don't, you treat the, the, the stranger well. Use what one stranger is in Egypt, remember? So I've got seen his models and ethics here that are just superior to anything. Anything they'd seen around them and anything they're used to. This is a new nation that God's forming here, you know, it's a new nation. And he's teaching them his ways. It is beautiful. It's perfect. I feel like also in that there's the opportunity for like forgiveness to occur as well. Yeah. It's like you say in that example of somebody who can like restore something when they've done yeah. wrong. You've got like repentance and action, yeah. and then that gives the opportunity for unforgiveness to be let go. It's yeah. like, you yeah. know, my man's just in the pen and yeah. he's done his bit, but the wall's still broken. Yeah. There's unforgiveness and bitterness, but yeah. if that like restoration's there, repentance is had, relationship is formed, you've got forgiveness. Yeah, so yeah. It's, True. it's just, just better all around. The building blocks of society. And, and the Lord always, relationships. when these uh, mishpatim are given, 
if you look closely, they're always re related to defending the innocent. So the eye for an eye, and you've heard it said, oh, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. And I'm like, you have not got a clue what's getting said. Because it says here, if violence erupts and a woman is her bearing child and she gives birth prematurely, an eye for an eye, a two for a two. So you missed that first part. And everyone just focuses on eye for eye, two for two, hand for hand, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. But the verse before it says, if violence erupts and a woman is her, or a woman is her bearing child so that she gives birth prematurely. So what, what the Lord's saying here is like, when a woman is carrying a child, yeah, she's the most vulnerable. The child is the most vulnerable. That's a, that's a habitat that needs to be safeguarded in a, in, in a real, you know, secure setting. And what used to take place is back in this era, people were bar bar barbaric. They'd go after you when you were most weakest. And if violence erupts and you're trying to take something or do something to a woman who's carrying child, the Lord's saying, this is, I'm taking this serious, you know. Yeah. So if so if harm happens to that woman and, and, and life is lost, your life will be lost as well. So what he's saying is there's a severity to protecting the innocent. But people just like brush past that yeah. and focus on the eye for eye, focus yeah. on the tooth for tooth. I don't recognise that the Lord is actually defending pregnant women who are bearing children because it's that's the most sacred thing. It's all about life and giving life and bringing forth children into the world and, and, and safeguarding innocence and safeguarding that what is most vulnerable and weak. Yeah. A woman with, with a, a bearing child within her womb, it's, it's two lives at risk, you know? So the Lord's saying, I'm defending this by putting that and attaching eye for eye in that setting so you can understand the severity as a deterrent uh -huh. on the matter. So yeah. people miss that, do you yeah. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. miss that. And you, could, you know, you, you, hear, you hear horror stories about women who've, who are carrying children and something happens and they lose the child or the woman dies and then, and then because the woman's died, the child dies as well. And you're like, oh, this is a horror story. Well, the Lord is defending them horror stories from really taking place in a, in a barbaric culture. And he's putting, he's putting it straight, saying, I'm not going to have this because no, no, he's no, no, the no. ultimate judge. Yeah. So people miss all that and focus on, well, life and I makes yeah, the whole world Yeah, alive. your God comes, one can, yeah. And you're like, no, this is actually pertaining to like defending yeah. proper innocence and safeguarding women who are bearing children. Like, so. Yeah. So, yeah. I Beautiful. I hope that makes sense to people. I always think it's important to, mm. to address that. Yeah. yeah. Well, you see, I, I, I stand by what I, I believe that how you interpret scriptures betrays what your heart, how your heart is. You know, you could read that and think, this God just endorses violence. Or you could interpret it the way you described it then and said, hang on, he's protecting pregnant women here. You know, it's how you, how you interpret the scriptures, what you read is really a revelation of your own heart. Yeah. You know. And you know, you've got to think that when a child is in the womb, they're, they're, they're ultimately like, the less without, I know David says, look in iniquity I was woven and my mother's uh, womb, I was born into sin, but they're, they're the closest to, let's say, innocence and purity. And that's why he uses that. It's like, because that child within the womb is yet to experience, yet to make a choice and, and sin, you know, at the age of accountability, so to speak. So he focuses round on what is, what is the weakest and the innocence, you know. After all, the kingdom of heaven is built upon babes, so he's safe God. It's written. But one of the keys to scriptures, I feel, is that God is always right. And if you're reading something, you think, no, I don't understand that, I don't know about that. That's because you don't understand it, you don't know about it. God is always right. And you'd have to take that as your basis and say, well, God's always right, he's perfect, and work around that. You know, you don't have to get God around your head, you've got to get your head around God and say, well, he's always, that, that's right. So I've got, to, I've got to understand accordingly, you know. That's one of the keys, I think, for scriptures, especially for apologetics, etc. Yeah. Back in that era, when you were vulnerable, that was when people would take the most advantage, you know. Um, and, and the Lord weren't having none of that. He was creating a nation that would serve the vulnerable, that would defend the weak. Mm. And uh, that's the focus of what we should be looking at here. Not like, what well, the death penalty, the this, the that. You know, if we've got to get our head around the word of God, we can't try and wrap the word of God around our head. We've just got to embrace it and understand and see it with the lens of the spirit and go, oh, wow, yeah, no, this is actually a defense. This is a safeguard. This is a deterrent. 
And you know what? I want to be part of that society. Mm. You know, I don't want to be part of a society where people go round and target pregnant women. That's wrong, mate. I, I, that just sends me white. I don't want to be part of that. Yeah, I, I want to be part of this. Mm. You know what I mean? And this is how it will be when Yeshua reigns from Mount Zion and the Torah will go forth. People won't do this stuff anymore. And this is why we need these right rulings because it puts a stop to it because the Lord says, and you shall put the evil from among you. Yeah. This is to set apart. Yeah. Who wants to be righteous and live righteously? That's what he's doing. Well, if you want to live righteously, these things won't even come into the equation. That's what God's doing. He's promoting love and eradicating That's the evil. Right. That's right. He's getting rid of darkness because light will always banish darkness. Yeah. Light will always banish it. You light a match in a dark warehouse, it banishes the darkness. Yeah. And this is the power of our Lord. So, so it's not just a boring long list of rules and regulations. <laughs> it's just beautiful. It's a defence. It's a deterrent. You know, it's perfect. I think we'll take a break there. We'll take a break there. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, we'll take a coffee break here. Um, so... Um, we'll be back for the second half in the meantime. Let's all enjoy it in Café con Dios. Shalom. <laughs> it's a little pointed to our editor. Brianda knows what I mean. In, I in Café con Dios is a, 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 caf, a, a coffee with God. Uh, and where, where our editor there, Mark, lives with his wife, Vivi, their fellowship in Mexico is called Un Café con Dios. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a little thumbs up. Okay, let's have a break. So welcome back. We uh, hopefully we all enjoyed your cup of tea or coffee or whatever, um, and some conversation with their brothers and sisters. We are now to we are now to ch we are now to chapter twenty three. Are we all sitting comfortably? Let me still begin. <laughs> you shall not circulate a false report. Do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. You shall not show partiality to a poor man in his dispute. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it. You shall not pervert the judgments of your poor in his dispute. Keep yourself far from a false matter. Do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not justify the wicked. And you shall take no bribe, for a bribe, for a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. Also, you shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger, because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Six years you shall sow your land and gather in its produce, but the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner you shall do with the, your vineyard and your olive grove. Six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the son of your, fe the son of your female servants and the stranger may be refreshed. And in all that I have said to you, be circumspect and make no mention of the name of other gods or deities, nor let it be heard from your mouth. Three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days, as I commanded you, at the time appointed in the month of Abib, for in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labours which you have sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering at the end of the year, when you have gathered in the fruits of your labours from the field. Three times in the year all your males shall appear before the Lord God. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until morning. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk, 
Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not put pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversity to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. You shall not bow down to their deities nor save them, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. So you shall save the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water. And I will take sickness away from the midst of you. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfil the number of your days. I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come. I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite and the Hittite from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little I will drive them out from before you, until you have increased and you inherit the land. And I will set your bounds from the Red Sea to the sea, Philistia, and from the desert to the river. For I deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out from before you. You shall make no covenant with them, nor with their deities. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For you, if you save their deities, it will surely be a snare to you. Wow, that's quite a lot there, isn't it? Okay, um, so that's for chapter 23. If you look back here at verse 4 and 5, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under his burden, and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it. This, um, this chapter here, it points to Jesus. Every, most of what we're going to read now points to Jesus. He actually told us that all the scriptures is about him. And um, he says that Moses wrote about me. If you believe Moses, you believe me. And people may ask, well, when did Moses write about Jesus? You know. Well, he's actually on every page. Jesus is on every page, even of the so-called Old Testament. Yeah, he's on every page, and he's on every page of the Torah, and he's on every page of this Parsha, and he's in this chapter, and we're gonna see him now. So verses four and five. Do we note here how one's enemy is now on the same standing as one's neighbor? See what he's done here? This is what Yeshua teaches. Jesus teaches this. It's in several places, but I'll quote Luke 6. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. This would have been quite radical at the time, by the way. Very radical. Your enemy's ox, the donkey of one who hates you. So we're taught, we've been taught how to love God, how to save God, how to love our neighbour. And now we're being shown even help your enemies and Yeshua came along and promoted this and endorsed this I say to you here love your enemies do go to those who hate you um, verses 10 to 12 six years you shall sow your land and gather in its produce for the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow the poor of your people may eat and what they leave the beasts of the field may eat in like manner you shall do with your vineyard and with your olive grove Six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may rest, and your servants may be refreshed and the stranger. This here is a, uh, a show, a display of our, our God's love and his infinite wisdom, his infinite wisdom. Everything in life must rest. Everything in life must rest. He showed this when he, during creation, with the, he set apart the seventh day as a Sabbath. Everything in life must rest, um, even the land. Even the land must rest. Now, this also would have been a new concept at the time, surely, even the land. 
And we know that if you don't let the land rest, there will be problems. In fact, if anything doesn't rest, there will be problems. Uh, we all sleep, animals sleep, nature uh, hibern it goes into hibernation, some animals go into hibernation. It's God's natural laws of physics, natural laws of life, that things must rest. Uh, rest is essential. Um, rest is life. We trust upon this in the week, didn't we, brother, last week? Um, rest is trust and dependency upon him. All things must rest, and God knows best. He's teaching us here that things must rest. Even in the new heaven and new earth, the new Jerusalem, the sun and the moon will rest. It's written. Um, I like this bit here, verse 12. Six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest. What, what can be easily skipped past here is that you, he's, God's telling you, look, you don't need to work every day of the week. You'll do everything in six days. You will be able to accomplish whatever you need to do in those six days. There's no need to work the whole seven. He's back. God is saying, look, I, I'm going to provide you with the ability and the scope to achieve everything you need to within the six days. And then you can rest on the seventh day. Six days, you shall do all your work. See what he's saying? Um, but these verses here, by practically from verse 10 to verse 19, it's God's teaching us how to save him and how we are to display our love for God. Um, you can read back over that in your own time, but we're up to verse 19 now. Um, the, second part, the second part of verse 19, it's... By the way, before we get on to the, the same... The seven days you shall rest and the, the, your servants and the stranger and the animals may be refreshed. This also would have been an, a new concept for people because animals would just be practically worked to death. You know, you, st you still see it sometimes, but he's saying, no, you rest and everything in your household, including the animals, shall rest and even the land. And you're thinking, what's all this about? God knows best, we just do what God says. Uh, verse 19, you shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. We were speaking about this in the break, weren't we, sis? Um, And here is the conclusion, by the way, of the Book of the Covenant. Um, it's the first three chapters in the, the Parsha, the Book of the Covenant. And this here, you shall not boil a young goat in its middle, in its mother's milk, is at the end of this, the Book of the Covenant. So it, it's like it's put there, and you can't help but see it. It's right at the end. It's so it's important, straight away, is uh, denoted. And also, it's mentioned three times, this, in the Torah. Um, twice in the book of Exodus and once in Deuteronomy and we know that scripturally anything mentioned three times is, is there's a significance attached you should not boil a young goat in its mother's milk and you think is there something deeper here this is something hidden you know a hidden truth a hidden gem there's been various suppositions about what this why this is put in but none of them really are conclusive. I, I, I tried to study it myself, but there's nothing really con conclusive. I think really it's, it's, it's speaking about models and ethics. We, we spoke about the nations around Israel at the time. They would have done something like this. Mm -hmm. it, you know, like John mentioned before, they, they were pretty barbarian, you know, and if, if you bumped into someone on the street, they'd probably like to um, take your life, etc. God had to impose these rules and regulations to, to govern a society and say, don't be like this, don't be doing that. You saw what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Don't be bound to their deities and their gods and doing, I want you to be a set apart nation and this is how I want you to live. And don't, please, don't be boiling on a kid and it's all mother's milk like these people do. I don't like this. I think he's trying to get across in the, the sanctity of life and the, the models that are involved and saying, look, if you're going to eat the, 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 a baby goat or a baby sheep, whatever, have the model capacity to say, well, don't boil it in its own mother's milk. To, don't have its own mother involved in its death kind of thing, you know. I think it's a model aspect here that he's getting across. And it also teaches us other things. If we look at Proverbs 12, a righteous man regards the life of his animal, 
but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. In other words, I don't want you to be wicked and cruel. I've, I've seen this around and I, I don't like this, you know, and I don't want you, my children, being of this. I don't want you doing this. And I think it's as straightforward as that. Um, but there's also a bigger picture going on here. In this chapter here, we, we've read how to live with nature, rest of the land, etc. Um, and how to treat animals with mercy and with respect, rest, let them rest, let them be refreshed, etc. Then the, the, the mother and the kid, don't be boiling the kid in its mother's milk. And um, so here in this chapter alone, we're being taught how to love God, love our neighbour, love animals and nature. It's practically the whole kit and caboodle here. You know, this is life itself. God, the people around you, animals and nature, that's everything. And our Lord is teaching us how to live life amongst all that. You know, it's, for me it's powerful and beautiful. Now here's one, it's verse 20. I send an angel before you. Now there's plenty of conjecture on this verse, or these following verses, but I send an angel before you uh, to keep you in the way, to bring you into the place which I prepared. Some say, well, no, it just means a messenger and it's referring to Moses. Some say, no, it is an angel. It's, it's either Gabriel or Michael or one of these super angels. Some say, no, it's Jesus. Mm. Um, so it's either Moses, one of the created angels, or it's Jesus. Um, as I said, many of the sages regard that it's the messenger, because in the Hebrew, malach mm. is the same word for a, a messenger or an angel. Mm. So that's where the, 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 the blair can be. So many of the sages regard that messenger, that malach, as Moses, who, who obviously and doubtless he is a special ambassador for God and he was commissioned. And he might well be tamed as like God's messenger. That's, that's okay. But when you see expressions like, he will not pardon your transgressions yeah. and my name is in him, you think, well, hang on, that's, surely that's above the stature of Moses. Who can who can pardon transgressions? Well, Moses can't, as great as he is. And who bears God's name? In other words, his character, his identity. Exactly, he says. He says here, an angel is to guide Israel on his journey to the promised land. His instructions must be received with the same respect and fear as those of God the Father himself. And then it says here, for God himself will be speaking in him. Where does it say here? Obey his voice and do all that I speak. So it's changed from the third person to the first. Obey his voice and do all that I speak. Do you see what's happening there? Obey his voice and do all that I speak. In other words, his voice is what I'm saying. For me, it's Jesus. For me. And it's okay. I'm, I'll be, I'm prepared to be proved wrong. I don't mind. It's okay. It doesn't really matter, to be honest. But... I think it's Jesus, it's Yeshua. And throughout scriptures, more than once he's referred to as an angel. You know, it's nothing new here. Um, but for me, this, this angel here, the, the angel of, of God is Christ. And if we think of when Paul was speaking about the, the events here in the wilderness, where we are now, we're at the foot of the mountain still, don't forget. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, and he's speaking about the Israelites in the wilderness, Paul, here. he says, No, let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted. So, Paul's saying it was Christ that was in the wilderness with the Israelites. See, let us not tempt Christ as some of them also tempted. In other words, like to test Jesus' patience, it's a question of his purpose or to, pro to provoke him back practically. But, you know, they didn't have the power to tempt him as such. Also, um, Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have pre prepared. This is another biggie here. Compare that now. Compare that sentence there. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Mm. Compare that face with John 14. 
I am going there to prepare a place for you. Now we know who's speaking here. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and welcome you, welcome you into my presence so that you also may be where I am. It's the same thing happening for me. It's Jesus and he's speaking about the promised land here again. And once again, verse 22, if you indeed obey his voice and do it all I speak, in the same sense, in a couple of words, he's saying some third person to first, if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak. By the way, in the Hebrew, it doesn't say indeed obey. It just says Shema, Shema. It's emphatic. And we know that Shema, it, 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 it denotes faith and obedience to hear and to do. It's a hear and to do. So we Shema, we hear and do, we all faithfully obey all that I speak. He doesn't say all that he speaks. Obey his voice, all that I speak. It's practically telling us here that God the Father is in the Son and the Son is in him and that they are one. So for me, the angel is Jesus, it's Yeshua. That's, you know, because he's the one we are to hear and to obey. Jesus is the one we shema. Matthew 17, amongst other places. While he was still speaking, behold, a, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him, hear him. In other words, shema him. Hear his voice, he's speaking for me. John 12, this is Jesus speaking. I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. So whatever Yeshua speaks is what the Father speaks. They are one. Ob obey his, all that I speak, all that he speaks, it's the same thing. Or by his voice, all that I speak. It's the Father and the Son. It's Yeshua. Uh, verse 28. And as I say, I'm prepared to be proved wrong. It doesn't matter. It's okay. But for me, that's Jesus. Uh, verse 28. I will send hornets before you, and they shall drive them out. I will send horns before you. Um. We also see this in Joshua, the book of Joshua, don't we? Talking about the conquests and how it came about, etc. Obviously, it's some kind of, it's an instrument of divine judgment going on. But whether they were literally hornets or some kind of pestilence, like a pestilential disease, we, we don't really, we can't be proven one way or the other. And really, it doesn't matter. But um, it, it is some kind of divine judgment going on, whether it's literally hornets or something else. It's from the Lord. He's, he's sending his, his fear before them. But what's interesting to me here is where it says, um, verse 30, little by little, I will drive them out from before you. Verse 29, I'll not drive them out before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. I'll do it little by little. This has always struck me this, because it makes you think, well, it made me think in my own lifetime, when I first came onto the Torah path, I was like, wow, that's it, this is the truth, everything I've ever known is just lies. This is the truth now. Oh, God, thank you, this is the truth. I threw my telly out, I threw all my old records out, it's all pagan, I'm getting rid of it. And I got rid of everything, and I, I, I practically threw the baby out with the bathwater, and I sort of let myself a bit exposed. Um, and I'm sure other people can have done the same thing. Um, get rid of your CDs, this is all demonic, this, he's, he's singing about that and blah, blah, blah. I don't want to rot telly anymore. But you can sort of leave a void within yourself and leave yourself vulnerable. That's what happened to me anyway. Because unless we're continually full of his spirit, which can be difficult and we know it is, we can all testify, we can leave ourselves prone to other things coming in the wild beasts of the world, you see. And I think our God in his wisdom has done this. You throw everything out and you, you've left yourself a bit empty and the wrong things in life start coming, sneaking back in. And so for, for some people, I think God has done this, especially myself included. It's probably better to get rid of all the dross we're done as little by little. You see, there's a wisdom in there, involved in there. And furthermore then, if you do it little by little, 
we're continually dependent upon God. You see, we have to be dependent on all the time, little by little, we just all the time. We can be looking at the darkness a bit too much and rather than case the darkness, you light a candle, you know. We reveal the light and then you'll see the darkness, you know. You seek the truth and then you see what's lies. You don't do it the other way around, you can be engulfed in, in darkness. Uh, okay. Uh, chapter 24, um, it's powerful this. Chapter 24, um, it's a real pointer to future events. What's going on here is our story and the future story. Past, present and future in the scriptures just all seems to roll in together, you know, as we know. And uh, this chapter here, there's a lot of um, future events being indicated and foreshadowed, as we'll see now. Okay, so we'll read through chapter 24. Now he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the birds of the Lord, and all the judgments, the mishpatim. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you, according to all these words. We can see what's going on here. Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity, but on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone, and the law and commandments which I have written, that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us till we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and Hare are with you, if any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. Then Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the, the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went to the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. <sighs> wow. It's just, that's, it's powerful, really, that. Um, as I said, this chapter here, it's pointing to future events. And we see, say, today that the sprinkling of the blood, um, Moses sprinkled the people, the altar, etc. We're redeemed through the blood of Jesus. We, you know, we can see what's, what's happening. It's a picture. It's a foreshadow. Then you have, um, then you've got the Lord on the mountain with Moses and the company of Moses, which is represents God's people. Uh, future events again, Revelation 14. Then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. So what we see going on at Mount, the mountain here, Mount Sinai, is, is a picture of future events going on. The lamb standing on Mount Sinai with his people, his children, you know. Now we know, it's because it's written, that no one can see God and live. Even heaven and earth will flee at his presence, okay? It's a consuming fire. But in human form, he's Jesus. And Jesus told us that to see him is to see the Father, okay? So we shouldn't be surprised that it's Jesus who's at Mount Sinai. 
don't forget, Jesus himself appeared to Abraham physically. We read that back in Genesis, Genesis 18. And here we see Yeshua but again for me. It's got to be Jesus. Because they mention seeing someone's feet. So that's human form. And don't forget, we're at the mountain, we're at the feet of God. You know, we're receiving and we're learning. It has little and, and figurative speech here going on. So the scene, feet, i.e. some kind of human form here. And remember that the one who delivered the Lord at Sinai was Jesus. Everything we see here is a, a glimpse of the future at Mount, Mount Zion. They had a covenant meal on the mountain before God. They, they saw them, they ate and drank with God a covenant meal. This is a precursor to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Another future event. It's it's so powerful. Um, by the way, this this sapphire. I tried to get a picture of it. I don't know if it'll really do it justice. But um, if you can imagine, above them just look like sapphire stone, and apparently. The purest form of sapphire, sapphire has um, glitter within it. It looks like sparkling, like so it looks like a blue sky with the stars in. That's what it looks like. So you can imagine this above them and they're seeing someone's feet. It's quite mind-blowing, actually, what, what, what they've witnessed. It must have been a beautiful sight to, to, to gaze upon, you know, like a paved work of sapphire. And you can imagine this, this sparkling in, in, in it, wow. And then someone's feet, wow. Truly, these are glimpses of the future that was taking place. Um, now let's look at verse 16 here. F before we do, let us remind ourselves that with God, with our Lord, one day is, is a thousand as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. We read this in Second Peter, don't we? So what seems like a thousand years to, to man is a day to, in God's eyes, basically. So looking at verse 16 now. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days and on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now remember at the very beginning of the Parsha I said we're going to return to this verse. If you can keep your fingers on chapter 21 verse 2. Because this whole Pasha, Mishpatim, begins and ends on practically the same tone. It's, it's a beautiful, they like, they like bookend the whole Pasha, it's beautiful. So we've got our fingers on chapter 21, verse 2, and here we are at chapter 24, verse 16. 21, 2 says, If you buy Hebrew servants, he shall save six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free and pay nothing. And remember, we are, we are his servants, you know, it's not about us, we're his servants. In 24, 16, now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Our sojourn here on earth is 6,000 years, six days to God. And in the seventh millennium, or in God's seventh day, we were to be with him. Verse 18, so Moses went into the midst of the cloud. First Thessalonians, then he who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. This part of Mishpatim, it begins and ends with this promise that we are his servants and he will call us in to be with him. After the 6,000 years, after the six days, the seventh day, we, will, we shall be with him. Okay, so let's summarise then a, a, a brief summary of what we just read today, Parsha Mispatim. Um, and I hope it brought some blessings to people um, and I hopefully it opened people's eyes um, and I hope it, it brought a lot of scriptures to people because I, I admit that the very first time I read this, it, it just, it was like a chore to read through it thinking, oh, it's just another long list. And I read it and thought, there, I've read it, but now, by the grace of God, who opens his children's eyes, I read these things and just see beauty, the beauty of our God and how he cares for us and teaches us. So to summarise, 
as I said to some people, Mishpatim, it might, it may seem antiquated and, uh, and obsolete. In other words, like, oh, it was okay for them and for then, but it's not for us and it's not for now, really, is it? And anyway, I haven't got an ox or I haven't got a piece of land that needs resting, so it's not for me. Well, it is really, it's for all of us. It's and these guidelines for everyone and they're for all time, you know. This is the original version of one's duty to care, as our sister Ellie said at the break. This is God's prescription for us. This is our duty of care, how he cares for us and how we are to care for others and for things around us, including animals and nature. Not just to the letter, but also in the spirit. So in the letter and in the spirit, God teaches, teaches us how to be fruitful in all of our relationships with him, with each other, with animals and with nature. As I said, you might not have an ox, but you've got a car. Uh, and you might not have a farm, but you've got a garden. God's law stands forever. God's law stands forever. Matthew 5, do not think, and this is Jesus, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. Assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is finished. And heaven and earth is still here. And when he says fulfill, it doesn't mean, oh, he's done it now, he's done it, we don't have to do anything now, Jesus has done it, thanks Jesus, we'll just do what we want, kick that out the window. No, fulfill doesn't mean that at all. Even in the English dictionary, fulfill means to carry out a duty or a role as required. This is in the English dictionary. To carry out a duty or a role as required or as promised or as expected. It's not to get rid of or to abolish. Let's look at it in the Greek. Fulfill in the Greek, and this is beautiful by the way. It's uh, the word is plero, plero. Fulfill in Greek is plero. And you can go through the definition yourself and it means to fully preach. So when Jesus says I come to fulfill it, he will come to fully preach it. And it also means to diffuse throughout one's soul. This word plero means to diffuse throughout one's soul. Sounds a bit different from getting rid of or to abolish. <laughs> diffuse throughout one's soul. That's, that's powerful and beautiful for me. If the Tanakh, and the Tanakh, for anyone who's questions that is the Torah, which is the first five books of Moses, the, which means instruction or teaching, uh, the Nevi'im, the prophets, and the Ketavim, the writings, Tanakh, uh, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketavim, it's an acronym, Tanakh, T-N-K, Tanakh. It's basically from Genesis to Malachi. If the Tanakh is no longer relevant, then why does Jesus always quote from it? Mm -hmm. including, pas including passages that refer to himself. There's no such thing as the Old Testament and the New Testament. We don't do that with this now. There's no such thing. It's one Bible. It's one Bible. This notion of Old Testament and New Testament was coined centuries ago by a Gnostic called Martian. And it just caught fire, and now it's just normal, like most things in life. You just it just comes in, and now it's not Christmas is now just normal. For years it wasn't there. Now oh, it's just normal. Why don't you do Christmas? You're not normal. Well, no, Christmas isn't normal. Why don't you do Black Friday the sales? What's we talking about Black Friday? Well, that's what we all do. It. Well, where did that come from? You know, <laughs> it's the same with this Old Testament and New Testament. It was just it was just coined. And I'll just call fire and I'll say, yeah, it's the old and the new world. It's not. It's one Bible. And throughout the Bible, we see cross-references all the time from the so-called old and the new. We see cross-references from the Tanakh to the latter writings. Even in this partial alone, go back to chapter 21, it says, um, eye for an eye, tooth for the tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Yeshua says in Matthew 5, he quotes it, You've heard it, that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I tell you not to resist an evil person. Again, the Tanakh's quoted, Exodus 21. And he who curses his father's mother shall surely put to death. 
Yeshua says in Matthew 15, God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother. He who cares his father and mother, let him put, be put to death. We also read that in Mark. Exodus 23, If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you should surely bring it back to him again. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden, you shall surely help him with it, etc. We see this in Matthew, we see it in Luke 6. I say to you, who hear or who shamar, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. This is Jesus once again referring back to the Tanakh, once again, over and over he does it. And we're told to just disregard it by Christians. Well, I'm a Christian, I follow Christ. And Christ can repeatedly quotes from the Tanakh. Behold, I am going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and bring you into the place which I prepared. We just read that in Exodus 23. John 14, I am going here to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and welcome you into my presence so that you also may be where I am. He's speaking about himself and he's quoting from the Tanakh again. Yeshua comes to diffuse the word of God throughout one's soul. That's what he came to do, the word of God. And we've just been reading the word of God, even in Pasha Mispatine, which might look like a long list of rules and regulations, but it's the word of God. And we read in 2 Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That is all scripture. And that includes his mispitim. So that's part of mispitim. Um, I hope it brings blessings to you all. Um, may God bless you. Uh, have a beautiful week. Shabbat shalom. Thank you.